and this was the first dashboard. Our first interface was a stick, came with the invention of the car, and turned into steering wheels like this, or this. Dashboards became design icons. Steering wheels became status, wait, joysticks? Your car lets you sing along to your Durans. So sorry you had to buy it all again on CD. That's it. We gave you controls, screens, buttons, early mobile phones, and then Bluetooth. Look, no hands. We made the dashboard hold your coffee or your popcorn. Things moved fast. We put the whole world on your display. Today, our cars go electric. And now, you can talk to your ride again. Hey, Mercedes. What can I do for you? Yeah, Mercedes. Here to tell you more about this exciting journey ahead is Ola Kalinius, CEO of Mercedes-Benz. Ladies and gentlemen, Happy New Year. And once again, welcome to Mercedes-Benz at the 2020 CES. Where do we take it from here? I guess that's the core question at every CES. And this inner unrest for what's next is also at the core of our purpose at Mercedes-Benz. Today, we would like to show you what that means. Now, I don't know how you spent your holidays, but for me, among many other things, Christmas is a great opportunity for su substantial research into cinematography. Or in other words, I'm a real film buff. I spend some time catching up old movies, watching new movies. Of course, one of the classics we've all seen it, is Back to the Future. It actually predicted that in 2020, we would be traveling by flying cars now. Yes, air taxis, they do exist. One example is the shared volocopter from a great team of entrepreneurs that we're supporting. But let's be honest, it's still far from a standard option today. But there's another technology another area of technology where the car has made great progress and still has amazing potential, which is connectivity. And to us at Mercedes, that's way more than pairing a smartphone to your car entertainment system. What I want to focus on tonight is the bond between human and machine. The video that we have just seen made one point. Tech in the car, it's all about the interface. From wooden sticks to switches and buttons, or all the way to our MBUX voice assistant, such as in our all-electric EQC. For example, you can ask Mercedes, how's your favorite sports team recently performed? Well, I'm afraid I'm a New England Patriots fan, so the other night, not too great, but if you ask, Another question, what's the weather going to look like on the way to your favorite ski resort? You're probably going to get a better answer. And later this year, you will also be able to control your smart home from the road. Just use your car to prepare your home before you get there. And the next step in the evolution in the interface of a Mercedes is just around the corner the first truly intuitive gesture control. Not learning a new sign language, but the car really understanding what you want intuitively. Because we believe the interface is key to providing customers seamless access to opportunity, but without being lost in complexity. The more natural the connection gets, the better. That's especially important for our business because people build highly emotional relationships with their cars. I don't know how many of you have a nickname for your smartphone. I don't. Uh, but we all know that many cars are called and treated like friends or even family. So it's even more satisfying 
when you can interact with your car like a friend. One idea that we want to show you tonight is based on biometric connection between the car and the driver. The car recognizes the human driver's heartbeat, its breathing, so man and machine literally merge into a fully intuitive experience. Selecting different functions, for instance, it's easy. Simply raise a hand and the menu is projected onto the palm of your hand. But before we get to that, there's another, perhaps even more fundamental dimension of connectivity that we just cannot ignore. And that is connecting tech and nature. Mercedes-Benz has always been a technology and a luxury brand, and it is time to bring luxury and sustainability even closer together. Because for us, the two are no contradiction. I'm a finance guy by training, actually, so I know that resources are always limited, including those of our planet. And I'm Swedish by birth, it's a beautiful, sparsely populated country with abundant nature, wildlife. Look at this beautiful picture. In fact, more than half of Sweden is covered by trees. To preserve nature, many things need to change. And we are determined at Mercedes to take responsibility. Some people might say, here's the easy fix. Stop people moving from A to B. Stop making cars all together. But let's face it, let's get real. Global demand for individual mobility is set to grow. Our 2019 sales figures prove that with the ninth record year in a row and the fourth consecutive year as the number one car brand in our segment. Our home turf, the luxury car market, is projected to outgrow the industry average. People love their individual freedom to go where they choose, when they want to. That's why our perspective is clear. We understand the boundaries of the planet, but we don't want to add new boundaries to mobility. In other words, fewer cars are not the solution. Better cars are. Yes, the continued growth of mobility means a corresponding growth in the use of resources. So normally, the resource curve would look like this. But we have to change that. Our approach is decoupling. Some here in Vegas may think of decoupling as undoing last night's wedding that you just remembered. But I'll leave that to your discretion. Decoupling the Mercedes way, however, means that we're decoupling volume growth from resource consumption. Our tools to achieve that are sustainable innovation and technology. Ultimately, we aspire to make the curve look more like this. And we have three main levers to succeed. Reduce, reuse, and recycle. With the ultimate goal of fully closing the loop from a value chain to a value cycle, and nature is and remains our greatest teacher in this. Nature has perfect cycles. Nothing is wasted. This attitude also sets the bar for the way we want to do our business. Bringing humans, machines and nature closer together will require action on many different playing fields. For us, step one is reducing our CO2 footprint. We have started that journey under the headline Ambition 2039. We are aiming at carbon neutral vehicle production, growing share of zero emission vehicles, many of them electric, some fuel cell for the commercial vehicles, and finally having a carbon, carbon neutral new passenger car fleet in three product life, life cycles by 2039. And we want to address this in a holistic way. 
And that includes driving our suppliers and our partners to comply with our objective of carbon neutrality. Our second, our next step, is we're focusing on resource preservation. Let me give you some examples. Saving water. By 2030, our car production plants are set to reduce their total water consumption per vehicle by more than a third. And that will add up to many hundreds of millions of liters of drinking water. The ultimate goal, of course, is a fully closed water cycle. That means our plants would reuse the water throughout the process. And we have initial projects underway in several plants around the world to test this. Another example, energy consumption needs to be reduced. Equally, by 2030, our car production plants are set to reduce the energy consumption by more than 40% per vehicle. Already today, our plants in Java, Poland, as well as in Hamburg, France, are run entirely on renewable energy. By the end of 2022, all plants in Europe will be carbon neutral, and the rest of the world will follow. And we're also reducing waste. In the next 10 years, our factories will reduce waste per vehicle also by more than 40%. Where we can't go for reduction, we're going to focus on the other two, reuse and recycle. As we keep expanding our electrical vehicle lineup, the battery becomes a major lever in this endeavor. A great example for reusing electric car batteries is giving them a second life as a stationary energy source. But ultimately, it's about closing the loop in a circular economy based on recycling. Every Mercedes passenger car is recyclable today by 95%. And this standard also applies, of course, to our new electric vehicles. Battery recycling is happening, but there's room for improvement. What we're aiming at are 100% recyclable batteries. So at this CES, we will show you a sneak preview of the next level battery technology for the future. At the same time, we keep encouraging our partners and suppliers along the whole value chain to further increase the usage of secondary materials. The obvious candidates for a car, steel, aluminum, and polymers, to foster this mentality, this philosophy of circularity, just as we do in reducing our CO2 footprint. To sum it up, the philosophy of reduce, reuse, and recycle will lead us to our ultimate goal, the zero impact car. A car that uses technology to provide maximum fascination for people, but has zero negative impact on the planet. This may be in the distant future, but it is our goal nevertheless. Pursuing this mission, we have teamed up with like-minded innovators who share our vision of putting tech and nature in balance. They have created one of the most fascinating and successful Hollywood movies of all time. And it is my great pleasure to announce the global partnership between Mercedes-Benz and the Avatar films. I'm deeply honored that the mastermind behind the Avatar saga, James Cameron, will join me with his team here on stage tonight. And we've already done some work together, and I would like to present the first result of this partnership. The Mercedes-Benz Vision AVTR, which translates to Advanced Vehicle Transformation. A visionary car that points far into the future, and a show car that is truly inspired by the fascinating world of Avatar. The results highlights completely new ways of intuitively connecting humans and machines without the wooden sticks and the plastic knobs and the steering wheel. The Vision AVTR also showcases new ways of moving people through the environment, sideways, almost like a crab moving 
through the landscape. And it takes sustainability to new levels through a fully recyclable battery which is based on an organic cell chemistry and doesn't need materials like, for instance, nickel or cobalt. This means in the future, the battery could be compostable. And yes, of course, it's going to offer incredibly fast charging too. This show car also uses many recycled and sustainable materials inside the cabin. A lot of people are talking about vegan diet. How about vegan dynamic uh, leather or Karoon woods made of fast-growing rattan? It also provides spectacular insights into nature and nearby wildlife while blurring the boundaries between the interior and the outside world. In fact, it is less of a machine and more of a living creature in its own right. Are you ready? Let me see if the Mercedes-Benz Vision AVTR is now ready to come to the stage. Here it is, the Mercedes-Benz Vision AV-TR. It is a show car, and show cars are here to spark our imagination of the possible, just like good science fiction movies do. Imagine a car that delivers a completely new experience, which combines an inside-out design philosophy with an outside-in approach to connecting passengers and environment. This car showcases new ideas of communication, for instance, by using its bionic flaps. Now, we'll hear more about these features from the joint teams that have put their passion and ideas and hard work into this project. Please give it up for John Landau and Gordon Wagner.
Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Isn't this car just jaw-dropping? Well, I want to welcome to the stage one of our, for the first of our three expert talks with Oscar winner John Landau, who's the producer of Avatar and the upcoming Avatar sequels, and Gordon Wagner, chief design officer at Mercedes-Benz. So, gentlemen, we've been talking a lot about that inner drive, so I have to ask you, what inspires your work? Well, Chilean, with open eyes, you can actually take inspiration from everything on this planet. For us designers, creating a car inspired by a fantasy or sci-fi movie like Avatar is a dream come true, John. It's been so great. So you fulfilled our dreams. <laughs> <laughs> For the vision of Avatar, we transformed that bionic and nature-focused inspiration from the Avatar movie to a futuristic concept that demonstrates how a vehicle can actually merge perfectly with its driver, like an avatar, and blend in harmony into its ecosystem. Gordon, Gordon is absolutely right. You know, you know, we take inspiration from everywhere. Our natural world is, is one that we take great inspiration from. Technology is another. Technology allows us to tell stories in ways that were not possible for and, and to communicate compelling and engaging ways. And Gordon and his team have delivered that with the car. Well done, sir. Well, I wish you all could stand here and be this close to the car because it is absolutely stunning. So Gordon, one of the challenges for you is because Mercedes-Benz is known for luxury, how do you figure that into the design of the show car? Well, our ambition at Mercedes is to become the world's most loved luxury brand. And the definition of the luxury of the future is about the fusion of beauty and intelligence. So therefore, the AVTR vision embodies that redefinition of luxury by combining the beauty of nature with the responsibility of sustainable luxury for our planet. Now, we spoke about this a little bit earlier, but can you elaborate more about how this show car is actually inspired by Avatar? Of course, Jilan, yeah. Uh, in deep discussions with uh, John and his team, we defined how our AVTR show car can actually pick up on all levels of the inspiration of the Avatar story. We created a futuristic vehicle that had to authentically look like it comes out of this amazing sustainable world. So. Also, that is a vehicle that is able to enhance the capabilities of your own body, like the idea of an avatar in that movie. So, eventually, we didn't want to create a car. We wanted to create something like a living organism. Almost like a human, right? So, speaking about the avatar movie, John, can you tell us how you were able to incorporate themes from the human world into that movie? Well, you know, first of all, Let's talk about what the first Avatar was about. You know, I tell people that the first Avatar began and ended with the same image, Jake Sully opening his eyes. Mm -hmm. And I always viewed that as a challenge to audiences to open their eyes and to understand that our actions have an impact on both people around us and the world around us. And I think this car has been realized and people who get in it, people who drive it, are going to feel that connection with the world around them and it's going to change how they look at the world when they get out of the car. And can you expand on that a little bit more? You know, our job is to tell compelling emotional stories. But I think we also have a responsibility to inspire people to take action towards a sustainable lifestyle, harmonious interactions with others. And if we could bring that again into the real world and Gordon and his team and the vision that Ola has laid out for them, uh, they've realized it in a magnificent way. Now, Gordon didn't mention Thank that this... Thank you so much for that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Now, Gordon didn't mention that this car does take a lot of its inspiration from Avatar. So, as a producer of Avatar, looking at this car, what's your favorite connection with the car and the movie? You know, I, I think the connection with the car is... We have Ewa on, on Pandora, and people get to make that connection to Ewa. People get in this car, and they put their hand on the controller, and the car reacts to them. It connects with them. It takes their, their biofeedback, and you really feel a pulse to the car. It feels your heartbeat, and you feel at one with the car. That's so incredible. Now, Gordon, we know that Mercedes-Benz is in this very unique position where you're able to shape the future. So talking about the Vision AVTR, what type of innovations can we see in the show car? 
Well, um, this concept is full of innovation. Our concept has, a, first of all, a progressive and sustainable bionic design that brings our design idiom of sensual purity to an entirely complete new level. The design of the shapes, therefore, is fast, smooth, and in harmony with nature forces. Uh, take, for instance, these aerodynamic flaps on the, on the rear of the vehicle. They mimic the raising of the hair of an animal when it's moving. And actually, they have some aerodynamic functions, but they can also respond to you. And um, secondly, that car has a futuristic look, thanks to this super futuristic, elongated, sporty, we call it one bow proportion of the body, which blends beautifully with these circle wheel arches here. And of course, these round wheels. So um, additionally to that exterior, the interior concept is, might be even more revolutionary. It shows a complete virtual instrument panel that takes the occupants on an experienced journey beyond reality. Also, when you look at the car, there's light strips connecting through the entire vehicle, something like, uh, creating something like a neural network. And uh, so this is much more than just an organic design. This concept car really merges the car and the driver into one living organism. What an incredible concept. It's been a great collaboration, a great experience. <laughs> totally, so inspiring. Well, John Gordon, thank you so much for your time. And although all of this sounds very futuristic, I have to say that I think these innovations, they aren't very far away. Would you guys agree? I agreed. I think, you know, you've got to push the boundaries. It's the innovators who lead. And that's what uh, Mercedes is trying to do. And that leads me to our next topic and our next guests. Let's take a look. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Vera Schmidt, Director Advanced Experience Design at Mercedes-Benz, and Ben Proctor, Production Designer for the Avatar sequels. Hi. Ben, Vera, welcome to the Hello. stage. Okay, I think that one subject that both of you are very involved with is this merging of humans with technology and nature. So, Ben, let's start with you. How does your team really touch on this topic? Well, I would say the merging of humanity with both nature and with machinery is a, is a key element of Avatar, for sure. Uh, can you explain a little bit more? I think, you know, a great example is the Navi people of Pandora. They have this incredible connection with nature that, that even the humans come to understand later on. Uh, and then on, and on the other side, you have the uh, incredibly high-tech neural link system of the avatars themselves, which is really what allows humans to explore the planet. That's really cool. And Vera, how are you influenced by some of these, these concepts when you're developing the user interface of the show car here? Well, we work on the interaction between man and machine every day. But in the vision AVTR, we created an immersive experience where we shaped the technology as a mediator between you as a human being and you as part of species, part of nature. So how does that work exactly? What do you mean? So the car expands your senses and it lets you experience the environment and the beauty of the nature around you. And um, this is really beautiful, so um, it becomes a very sensual extension of your skin. Can you describe the features in a little bit more detail? So nowadays, if you approach a car, you are the one who is reaching out to the car. You push a button, you touch a display, but uh, in the Vision AVTR, you lift your hand and icons are projected on your skin, on your palm, and even if you move it, the interface moves with you. So it's really that the machine starts uh, reaching out to you, like in a living organism. I feel like we're just scratching the surface, right, Ben? Mm -hmm. Is there more, Vera? Yes. Uh, we have a curved dashboard projection. And on this one, you can switch to a bird's eye view, and you can see the environment through the bird or through the eyes of the bird or a different animal. And you can also see natural forces, which are usually not visible to the human eye. For example, you can see magnetic fields, you can see the energy flow of trees or the wind, so that's fascinating. It's just amazing. Okay, so a question for you both. I feel like when you're talking, there, you're, you're showing us that there are starting to be a lot of similarities between film technology as well as automotive technology, would you say? 
I would totally agree. You know, on the first Avatar, we had to create new film technologies to immerse people in this, this new kind of brilliant 3D imagery that was bright and colorful and, and amazing. Um, and of course, on the sequels, I think we're going to introduce some new standards as well that will hopefully, hopefully surprise people. Um, <laughs> but what we're seeing, I think, in this project that we've done together is that the, this kind of immersion, this kind of full sensory experience is also making its way into the automotive industry. And Vera, would you agree with that? Absolutely. So, and especially this development, it will intensify in the future with all the interfaces and technologies we have. Okay, so we're looking into the future now because that's one of the topics that we're discussing. So, what, what future technology are you both most excited to work with? So for us, it's visualizing information on different shapes, materials, movements, where even the human gets part of the digital landscape, for us that's key. Because only then we can start transforming car to the medium to digital membrane. Okay, so if I may put it simply, are you trying to say that digitalization will then become the essence, the lifeblood of the vehicle? Yes, absolutely. So we think that digitalization, it will spread like an aura around you, and it will become the DNA of the car. That is so incredible. And Ben, what about you? Um, you know, on Avatar, we try to take people on an incredible emotional journey through the, the medium of cinema. But I think it's also really interesting to look at AR and VR and all these other new media and think about where they're going to go and to see them starting to sort of convey uh, the same sense of, of intense emotion, the same awe, the same connection that we associate with Avatar. It's very exciting. It is all very exciting. All right, guys, thank you so much for your time and especially for those insights. Ladies and gentlemen, the future is a very funny thing. Right after it occurs, it becomes the past, but it has always fascinated artists and scientists to look far ahead in order to capture people's hopes and desires and to anticipate new technical possibilities. So now I welcome two experts who are doing exactly that. Ladies and gentlemen, our final expert talk before James Cameron hits the stage. Please help me welcome Ashritha Kamath, art director of the Avatar Films, and Alexander Mankowski, futurist at Mercedes-Benz. So a question for you both. In what ways are the Avatar sequels and the Vision AVT are really pushing boundaries? Um, in the filmmaking sense, I think pushing boundaries means to overcome a variety of creative, technological and monetary challenges to tell a story that completely captivates an audience. Uh, for example? Um, one example would be in the Avatar sequels, we created an underwater world and then we developed the technology that allowed us to shoot motion capture underwater. I think a lot of us have heard of that, right? So tell me, what exactly were your tasks? Um, so in the art department, we are responsible for giving the director's vision a tangible form as well as to create the overall look for a film. I believe that a well-designed film like the Avatar sequels are one that completely immerse an audience in the story, convincing them that the world of the film extends far beyond the, conf the confines of the set. Mm -hmm. And Alexander, how about you? Uh, As a scientist, like what, uh, in what context do you see this vehicle? Uh, the context is we have to know what sustainability is. Yeah? And a very good model to understand sustainability is the so-called Gaia model from James Lovelock. Gaia model means that our biosphere is, is a system, a kind of a system which maintains its own livable environment so that we can breathe air and the air is breathable for us. It's not, it's not an accident, it's not a given. It's a biosphere doing that. And uh, the car then for, for this one is that it gives us the opportunity to, to, let, to feel these, to see this bio, biosphere, yeah? Mm -hmm. Like what, what Vera, Vera has told us here, yeah, to see the, 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 the magnetic lines, the, the communication, what, what the biosphere is doing. So I feel like you're talking a little bit about meaningful technology, if you will. Can yeah. you go in a little bit deeper about what meaningful technology is? Yeah, meaningful technology should be a, t or is, should be a te technology which uh, connects us to, to nature, to the biosphere, because we are a part of this nature. Yeah? We are part of the biosphere. It's not us and it, yeah? So a good technology would serve as a medium yeah, between this biosphere, which is us also, 
yeah, and what we are, because we as human beings, we are tool making <laughs> beings. <laughs> yeah, so we have, we need all this technology, and yeah, we are not naked, and so we are need the connection. And if you have the connection with the biosphere, then yeah, then we have, the, as, as Ola Kalina said, this circular economy yeah should fit into this biosphere. All right. So one last question. I mean, we're talking so much about the future. How do you see the future as a scientist? Um, as a sci yeah, I, I would say. We, we are, we are uh, um, working with many creative people about that, and yeah, <laughs> and that's, that's fun. Um, it, is, it is a togetherness yeah, between, between us, living plants, yeah, live, live life in, as it is, and mediated uh, through, as again, as technology. It is, um, yeah, we, we will see a picture of, out of that. It's yeah. very insightful. Well, thank you so much, Ashwita, and thank you so much, Alexander. All right, are you guys ready? Thank you so much. Now, please help me welcome for our last expert talk. You've been waiting all night for him. He is none other, none other than Academy Award winner James Cameron to the stage. Hi there. Jim, good to see you. Thank you. And I'd like to welcome Ola back on the stage as well. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Ola. How are you doing? Hi, uh, good to see you. What a great couple, right? So, gentlemen, I'm sure everyone out here is wondering the same thing. What brought you two together, and how does a relationship, a collaboration between Avatar and Mercedes-Benz EQ make sense? Jim. Well, I don't think it's obvious when you first hear about it. And it even wasn't obvious to me until I heard the vision, uh, a, a two-decade vision from Ola himself, talking about this huge commitment that they've made to sustainability. And I think that shows such a leadership position. And so many other companies are going to have to, to, to follow. And, but, you're, but you're leading. You're doing it. And, and you've made this uh, commitment, I believe, from the heart. And you're not just doing it at the vehicle, kind of at the tailpipe by electrification and fuel cells and all that sort of thing, but you're doing it in your, your, uh, the way it, you're going to manufacture the vehicles and you're going to extend that back, as you were saying, to your, to your suppliers and all the way back through the supply chain. So it's a, a total, sort of total life cycle assessment of the entire process. And that's inspirational to me because my main thing in life right now is sustainability. And I mean true sustainability. How are we going to do this? What's our future going to look like? And so I think tonight is all about the future. You know, when I, I look at this vehicle here, you know, I see the future, not just an automotive future with all the wonderful things that it could inspire that could feed back into the cars that are real production cars. And by the way, I was devastated to find out that I couldn't just order one. <laughs> but apparently we're a ways off on that. But it's also an aspirational future. What kind of future do we want to have as human beings? You know, are we going to continue to, to be takers or are we going to become caretakers? You know, are we going to protect nature? Are we going to protect the mother, the Gaia force that sustains us here on this planet? Are we going to turn our, our back on it at, at our, our peril? And so for a major manufacturing company like Mercedes to make this commitment, I think is just awesome and should be, should be celebrated. And to me, when I look at this car here, I see a beautiful car, and I love cars, and I see so many amazing, innovative things, but I also see the physical manifestation of a philosophy, of an idea, of an emotional idea. I would, I would go so far as to say a spiritual idea made manifest right in front of us, and that inspires me. That's incredible. Uh, Ola, can you talk a little bit about how your interests have aligned with Lightstorm and Jim? Well, as I mentioned at the beginning of my speech, uh, I've always been a film buff. Yeah. So I've been watching your movies, huge fan over all these years. And of course, uh, next to a great story, which is, which is essential for, for a hit for a good movie, uh, what's fascinated me and impressed me is the use of technology. Yep. I've observed that back to the movies 
80s, 90s, how technology has evolved and even uh, understood from you, you have sometimes waited on executing a movie right. because the technology is not yet there. Yeah. And I had the chance to, to visit Lightstorm um, uh, Productions to see, you know, kind of peek behind the scenes, how is the next Avatar movie going to be shot? And if you're in the business of technology, like, like car people, you, you really eat, sleep and drink technology, and you get to peek into somebody else's kitchen and see how they're doing it, I was blown away. So that innovative core uh, is a perfect fit between the Avatar team and Mercedes-Benz. And then comes what uh, Jim was talking about, sustainability. Uh, we have, of course, always tried to make our vehicle as efficient as possible. That's, that's not the issue. But this major pivot to realize we are at a very important point in our development here. And, you know, do we want to sit back and just see what happens? Or do we want to be architects of that future? In that sense, with the first Avatar movie and the whole philosophy behind that, uh, Lightstorm was ahead of us. Uh, but we're going in the same direction. So tech people understanding the importance of sustainability, it was really a perfect match for us. That's incredible. So, Jim, I have to ask you, we've all been talking about that inner drive. So as the creator of Avatar, the sequel that's going to explore the worlds a little bit more, mm -hmm. what is your inner drive? I'm driven by a couple of things. One is just my passion for storytelling. I love to tell stories, and I love to tell stories with images. So the perfect place for me is, is to be a filmmaker. Um, and I've, I've dedicated my life to that. But in recent years, I've also dedicated myself to the cause of sustainability in many forms, at first it, with energy and then with, with uh, food choice and so on, the, the impact of, of uh, agriculture and so on on our, our environment. And it occurred to me that the perfect way to fuse both of those powerful drives was to do more Avatar movies because if you've seen the first one you know that this is this is a film and the sequels will follow in that same thematic vein that celebrates nature and our place in it and our connection to it and I believe that the way that film worked to some extent because of its beauty and its sense of wanting to be there and wanting to ride those creatures and fly through those mountains and so on was that it awoke in the viewer that sort of childlike sense of the wonder and the curiosity and the joy in nature that we all have when we're kids. And then as we grow up and as the world grows up and becomes more urban and less rural, I grew up in a rural environment in, in Canada, but as we become more urban, we have this kind of nature deficit disorder that we're all collectively suffering from. And part of that is denial of, what's, of what we're doing. And part of it is that we just sort of turn our backs on it. And so I think that to, for, for us to survive here as a civilization on this finite world, we have to embrace these ideas of sustainability. So that's what's driving me now. That's why I'm making the movies, because I'm naturally a storyteller. I'm naturally curious. And the other thing I, I love is innovation, technical innovation. I love it. I love creating new creatures and all these new designs. I work with some of the best designers in the world. You got to meet uh, Ben Proctor earlier. Uh, I have a really inspiring design team. But I like to create new technology as well. And I like to see something manifest itself on the screen that no one else, frankly, knows how to do yet. And we'll tell them all after we're done, but we won't tell them beforehand. And we always can never wait to hear about the technology that you've created for your storytelling. Now, speaking about your movies, I mean, first and foremost, they're highly entertaining, like you were saying, right, Ola? They are so great to watch, but they're also an incredible way for you to communicate your message, your passion, for instance, about the Earth's environment mm -hmm. and its species. And can you talk about how you use the film Avatar to really reflect that passion? Well, look, I think that, that you, can, you can have a preachy film and you'll be preaching to an empty house. So at first and foremost, first, second, and third has to be a good story, ideally well told, with good characters that you care about, and there's some kind of emotional connection. But clearly be between the lines of the first Avatar film, and we're continuing in that vein, is this respect for this deep love and refer reverence for nature and the system of nature that keeps everything in balance. So when you see those big blue cat-like people in, in Avatar, the Na'vi people, 
they awaken in us a kind of a, a respect. That they, they remind us of our better selves. It's not really meant to be a story about the bad humans and the good Navi. It's about the best of humanity as represented by these Navi characters who kind of represent the more primal version of ourselves that knew how to live in, in balance. And now things are so out of balance. And so in the, in the new films, we'll be having, you know, good humans and bad humans, good Navi and bad Navi, actually. And it's a question of values. It's a question of do you want to be a taker or do you want to be a caretaker? Do you want to be a custodian? Do you want to be a steward? Do you want to aspire to a future where cars like this are possible? or a degraded future. We have that choice, and that's the choice that we need to make now relative to the, the world that we're going to be passing on to our children, our grandchildren, and future generations. And so, you know, I salute you and your, and your company for the commitment that you've made to that aspirational future. And speaking about the respective industries that you both work on, you're both ahead of the class there. So why is constant innovation so important in both of these industries? Well, we talked about what's next. That's the question we have been asking ourselves. Our founding fathers, they asked themselves that question. They, were, they created a new industry. They didn't improve the horse or the horseshoe or made it light or anything. They just broke new ground and asked that, what's next? Yeah. So that is really at the core of our DNA, to constantly think about that. And what did it give us? It gave us a fantastic gift individual freedom, self-determined individual freedom. And that beautiful invention, in a nice wrapping, Gordon, uh, that needs to be reinvented now. And that's why we're going from what we call modern luxury to sustainable modern luxury. We got to make the beautiful machine a sustainable, beautiful machine. And we're going to need all the creativity, all the ingenuity, Every engineer in our company is going to have to dig deep because there are, of course, a lot of challenges on this road. Mm -hmm. Also, financial challenges. Uh, but if you put your mind to it and you, and you make up your mind that you're going to solve this problem, uh, you probably will. Uh, if you don't, nothing is going to happen. That's very true. Once you're dedicated, you can do it. Yeah. So, Jim, what about you? Why keep pushing in your respective industry? You've done pretty well, you know, so <laughs> why keep pushing? And when you're looking towards the future, what's next? Okay, that's two questions. So, so the, the need for innovation, I think, you know, my career trajectory is basically sort of living proof of the need for innovation. I look at the milestone films that I've made that were big hits. A big part of what attracted audiences to those movies was that sense of dreaming with your eyes wide open. Whether it was the liquid metal guy in, in, uh, in Terminator 2 or the, or the intelligent water tentacle in the abyss or whatever it was. Those, those were literally things that were not possible the year before that we willed into existence in order to tell that specific story. And now, of course, those tools are ubiquitous, and anybody can do those things now, years, years later. So we have to constantly be looking ahead. Uh, the universals of storytelling never change. Great characters, people that you can invest in, human emotion. You know, that goes back to the Greeks and, and all the way back 4,000 years to the Epic of Gilgamesh, you know. But the, the specifics of what you see on the screen and the journey that you're taking, that changes, and it's dynamic. And if you want to stay, I mean, the worst thing that can happen to an artist is to become irrelevant. So you, to stay relevant, to stay, you know, surfing the crest of that wave, you have to change. And you have, everything that I started out with as a filmmaker 30-some years ago has changed. About the only thing that's still the same is the glass in the lens. We write on to a, to a digital medium, everything's done CG, it's all, it's all digital. All the things that I, that I learned, my initial craft, gone completely. But the principle stays the same, that you've got to ride that wave. And Ola, what about you? When you're looking to the future, what do you see as next? Well, I see next to turning this into a sustainable machine, there are so many other technologies that are working together now. Uh, we talked about connectivity, in this case going all the way, more or less merging humans um, with the machine itself. So, interface. 
but making it intuitive. It needs to be easy. You shouldn't have a, a PhD in computer science to understand how to do it. Uh, sometimes we joke in our meetings, uh, it needs to be understood by a five-year-old kid or a board member at uh, Mercedes. And, <laughs> And if, it, and if it passes that test, if it passes that test, um, then uh, uh, then we're probably good to go. Uh, and if I look around, and I'm really excited to to see what's new here at the CES this year. If I look around at what so many other companies are bringing to the party, and it's interesting to see, by the way, how many tech companies use the car to display their technologies. Mm. So we got a little bit of co-creation going on mm -hmm. here. And you could argue a car company, as far as this proposition is concerned, is the master integrator of all of that. Yeah. So some of it we will, of course, invent ourselves. Maybe the organic uh, battery chemistry that we were talking about. Some of it we will find with other people. Or we will take inspiration from other businesses. Uh, and then move the game on to the next level. That's what drives us. I see a, I see a future where we continue to co-evolve with our technology. Our technology is changing us, and we in turn reflect our needs into that technology. And we will, we will merge. We will, we will absorb it, and it'll just become such a natural part of our lives. It already has that we don't even think about it. You know, a five-year-old Navi child can jump onto a banshee and plug in and fly. And so, you know, the, the idea of, the, of making it so simple and intuitive and obvious that anyone can do it, I think that's the important thing. Too much, so much is possible now, but too much of it is complex at the, at the user interface. And that needs to be cleaned up. And of course, there are always, you know, the, the tech nerds that love, you know, to learn all that, the hacks and the tricks. But I think the average person wants it to be invisible, wants it to be transparent. And it's pretty amazing. You know, when I, when I sat in this car and you, you put your hand on the control interface and it just, it just breathes. It just, it seems alive, it's organic. And so I think that our technology will become more organic and, and more easy for us to, to interface. And so, you know, this car is symbolic of that and maybe some of the manifestations of the specifics won't show up, you know, for a few years in, in your, your future model lines. But you have to start with the gesture, you have to start with the idea. So I want to take this conversation to um, another realm here. Ola actually let me in on a little secret. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I hear you may have brought us a little something to show us Couple about Avatar 2. Couple of glimpses. All right, would you mind sharing it with everyone? Because okay, I think everyone well, here think is super excited to see that, It's too late to right? say no, they're running it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're just so going to we go through. Here? Well, I mean, I think if I sum it up in the broad strokes, I see a world that I want to go to. That's what we're trying to create. That's what we're trying to create with our, with our designers, an aspirational world. Because by falling in love with it, you want to protect it. So you feel invested, right? And so our world is beautiful. We take our inspiration from our world right here on Earth, and it's still beautiful. Many, many parts of it are still spectacular, and we need to fight to protect that. And that's really the message of Avatar, and that's why I thought I'd share some of these images to give you a sense of what you might look forward to. It's so incredible. Thank you so much for sharing that concept art. Did you guys love the concept art from Avatar too? I mean, come on. Thanks. That's so beautiful. Thank you. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. It was so insightful and so enjoyable. Now to wrap up the presentation, I am going to pass it to you, Ola, who has just a few short words to share with you. So Ola, back to you. Thank you, Chilan, and thank you, Jim, for joining us and for this great partnership. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed the show just as much as we did. We believe that aiming high and thinking ahead is paramount uh, in this process, in this transformation we're in. We believe that inspiration and fascination are the most powerful drivers for change and progress. Our way is sustainable modern luxury. Our tools are technology and innovation. The transformation of the automotive industry at large and society as a whole, is something we look forward to. That's an attitude that we share with Jim and his team. We are quintessential tech optimists. And the vision, advanced vehicle transformation, is a symbol of that. And a reminder, the best is yet to come. <laughs> Thank you very much, and have fun at the CES 2020.